So, welcome. Um, everyone listening in the audience, if you're hearing me, this is a silent conference. So in order to hear us, you'll need to have your headsets on at all times. That's my first announcement. And my second announcement is that you'll have the ability to ask questions to our distinguished panel, which I'll introduce in a second, via the app, the Paris Peace Forum app, on your phones. And I will get these questions at the end. Um, we'll do a session for an hour and a half, and we'll end with sessions, uh, with questions for 30 minutes. So you have joined our intimate cocktail party here, early morning cocktail party, on the governance of artificial intelligence. My name is Martin Tisney. I'm the managing director for Luminate, which is an investment company part of the Emidiar Group. And I'll just spend a few minutes talking about our theme and then introduce our panelists and kick off with our conversation. The, I think one of the tricky things talking about the governance of artificial intelligence is that the theme is obviously so broad, right? AI touches on services, it touches us on health, education, pretty much everything, jobs, the economy, the future of work. It touches on politics, military, security applications of artificial intelligence. We've recently seen you know, the impact of AI on our democracies, on our politics, and then there are cross-cutting themes that have been developing, questions around AI replicating bias and discrimination in the workplace. So a, a lot of experts and people have been talking about how we should balance the innovation in AI with regulation. So one of the questions I'll be asking to the panel is, is that really the dichotomy? Is there a dichotomy between innovation on one hand and regulation on the other? How do they fit? That's my first point. The, Second point is, we are here to talk about how to govern AI. So what are the modalities for doing so? Especially at a time when innovation is going at such a breakneck speed. So if you're a government and you're seeking to regulate artificial intelligence, how do you not end up in a situation where you're always running behind the latest innovation, learning about it and trying to play catch up? So how do you set the framework in which the innovation can take place, but within certain boundaries? And is that the way to think about it? I think we, we often think about laws and hard laws when we talk about regulation and governance, but there are a number of other things. There are technical standards around artificial intelligence. There are soft norms set by civil society. There's soft law by the European Union and other bodies. Um, and then there's hard law. There's legislation by government. So I'd like to talk about those different modalities. And my third point is, like, when we're talking about governance of AI, are we talking about states that are setting their own rules of the road and their own norms? Are we talking about bottom-up innovations that are developed by civil society, by the private sector, and that then emerge to be best practice at the global level? Or are we talking about what I might call sort of agile multilateralism, where different countries, which are not necessarily aligned geopolitically at all, different countries may join forces with private sector companies and civil society organizations to develop standards, norms, best practices in a particular part of in a particular industry, in a particular sector that's touched by AI. It could be the job market, it could be education, it could be a specific part of, of healthcare, for example. So as one of the outcomes of this conversation on the governance of AI, I'd be very keen for the panel to surface concrete ideas on the governance framework. How would that work? So that what would be the call to arms for the audience? Are we saying, are we coming out of here and saying, right, let's spend the rest of the day looking at like-minded, finding like-minded governments, companies, civil society organizations to start something new? And so those are many reasons for which I'm excited um, about our panel. So to introduce um, our distinguished panelists, to my left, we have Rashida Richardson, who's a director of policy research at the AI Now Institute in New York. Welcome, Rashida. A um, little further on, we have Commissioner Moedas, who's the European Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation. Welcome. We have Antoine Bordes from Facebook, who's the director of AI Research Science at Facebook. Welcome. Tabitha Goldstaub, um, who has two hats, who's the founder, co-founder of Cognition X, a private sector company working on AI in the UK, and also chair of the recently created AI Council in the UK. 
Ross Lajeunesse from Google, who is the Global Head of International Relations. And last but not least, um, Minister Al Olama, who is the Minister of State for, Inter for Artificial Intelligence at the UAE. Welcome. So, we will have a more of a salon conversation, so I'll, I'll be asking people to jump in when they want to talk and have a lively conversation um, for, our, for our audience today. What I am suggesting we should do is start with um, a project, a specific project by Facebook, which is looking at fairness in machine learning, and then to use that as a springboard to talk about private sector innovations around artificial intelligence, to then talk about public sector applications of AI, and then talk about the governance piece, both at the state level and internationally. So Antoine, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a new setting for me. I can't hear myself, so it's a bit uh, it's unsettling, but OK. Um, yeah, so um, very interesting panel. Happy to be here. Um, so I, I, I thought that I could kickstart the discussion maybe by giving some examples about how we are proceeding right now at Facebook when we are developing AI. Um, and I, I would like to use, to use like two contexts. The context about how we are setting up when we're developing new products that are based on AI, but also how we are trying to advance the AI research as well and how, how we try to do that in the best way. Uh, I really like how you kickstart the discussion in terms of should we have like bottom up, should the private sector try to handle the, the governance? I think that's really something that we, we really try to do every day. So I can give examples. So in the, the first part, how we are actually developing AI into products, um, usually we try to have like three blocks, okay, uh, that we call people, data, and algorithm, okay? So the idea is that everything starts by, uh, with the people, okay? The AI is developed by people, the, the AI is trained by people, and the AI is used by people. And something we came to realize is that people have biases, uh, people have, uh, have flaws, and so it's very important when we develop something new that we can actually try to mitigate those from the, from the start. And so the way we work internally is that when a, a new application based on AI is, is supposed to be launched, or actually we're working on it, we also have, uh, the team is starting it, but we also have an independent team who's actually a cross-functional team with uh, ATCs, lawyers, um, data scientists, social scientists, who actually use as internally as an external body who's actually trying to monitor the development of the application. Uh, to, this is the goal to try to cross mitigate the, the bias that the people setting up the application could have. Um, beyond that, we try to also have this team to be very connected with like external multi-stakeholders because the idea is that uh, the bias are, have to be also, they need to be researched there to try to first you, or you can actually uncover them or can mitigate them. So that's why we're actually working with uh, the partnership on AI, I think we might talk about it later, or other like cross uh, national and cross uh, uh, companies, uh, institution to try to work on what kind of standard we should follow. And really try to use that when we are designing the first application. The second pillar is the data. Mm. So when the application is on the way, um, of course, we try to, to really from the start to train the people uh, labeling the data, which are internal, also to be aware. Basically, a lot of the process is people have to be aware that there are, there are biases and there might be flaws, and we, we need to keep repeating that all the time. And so when we are when we are taking the data for the application, we really try to make sure that we respect the diversity of uh, the population we try to, to work from, and also try to, to really use only the data that's necessary for the application at hand and not try to, to go beyond that. And the third pillar of this is what we call algorithm, and it's, even if you make sure that the, the people have been trained we look at this, even if you make sure that the data is as uh, diverse as possible, then when you apply the algorithm, you still want to check that basically what you're, you might put uh, online also respects some, some standard. That's why we developed this new tool, what we call the fairness flow, which is a way to, for the people who actually, before putting the, the application out there, uh, the, the team can actually have a very precise dashboard that will tell it like what are the different failure mode or the different success mode for different kind of demographics for different kind of parts of the population on which we would like to basically be uh, fair to. So you could say, can I break down the results by, by age? Can I break down by demographics? So can I see that basically my algorithm is going to reflect the, to perform as well or as bad, depending on these demographics. So that, that, these are really the principles we use. Um, then the second aspect I wanted to touch upon a little bit is that f for us, AI is a set of tools, 
Okay, so AI are new tools that are going to be that are able to to do new application, but these are tools. So what I just talked about was how we try to apply those tools responsibly and in an in a ethical manner. But I also want to explain how we can to develop the, the new tools. Okay? And when we develop the new tools, this is the part I'm from, the AI research team. Um, in this part, we really try to do it. Our ethic there is to do it very openly, in the sense that we publish everything that's done in the research lab. We open source everything that's done in the research lab. And most of the research to develop the new tools is done on uh, public data and not on Facebook data, which allows really to have a conversation in between the scientists in our lab and the overall uh, research community. And we believe that that's, that's the way that this should be done when you're actually developing, creating new algorithms that could do amazing things. If you want to do that and bring everybody together to be able to use them and also to understand them, we need to develop the new tools uh, in an open and collaborative way. And for us, it goes through publication and uh, open sourcing. Brilliant, thank you. So if I understand correctly, there's three things. There's you bring external stakeholders in, you're aware of the environment, you contextualize it for the data and the algorithm, and then the tools are open so people can engage with them. Yeah. On, so, so a quick question, then, then I want to open it up. Um, on the external stakeholders, so my sense is there's an interesting development that we're seeing in the AI field whereby large and small companies are bringing external stakeholders in to advise. So, so DeepMind, which is part of the Alphabet Group, has an ethics and society team. That team has different advisory boards with externals on it. Could you maybe just say a couple of words about how, from a governance perspective, you involve external stakeholders yeah. in your internal practices? Yeah, so it's... a uh it's really an ongoing conversation that we uh, usually have, is the sense that uh, our team internally have use cases and examples that can actually nurture the, the conversation externally. And on the way, we actually use that to develop our team. So uh, the way it works is that, I mean, we have multiple process, but we have working groups, we have uh, round tables, where we actually try to join some experts around, discussing about the, the project. We even have some actually research projects that are done in jointly between universities and Facebook teams to try to push the, the, we try to be very creative in the way we do that. In Paris, we're developing like a PhD program where we'll have actually a PhD uh, students who are going to work on AI and ethics uh, in, a, in an open way, but try to, to ground it to some of the, the challenges and so uh, the way we see. So we try to be very creative there. Brilliant, thank you. Please. Yeah, no, we, uh, we very much follow that model uh, at Google, and in, in a way, it's not really something revolutionary. This is just a continuation of the multi-stakeholder model, which Google and others have long argued is really the only way to uh, deal with internet technology issues. And uh, what Antoine is describing in the way that Google looks at its responsibilities and the, the right way forward is, is very much the same. It's the continuation of that model. You mentioned, oh, governments are struggling to keep up. Um, one of the ways you deal with that fact is you approach these issues by bringing governments and civil society and companies and academics together in the same room to discuss like we do at the Internet Governance Forum, which is happening across town at this very moment. So, you know, I think it's true when we talk about many issues with AI. It's, it's a sexy thing. People are talking a lot about AI, and we definitely need to be having the conversation. Um, but a lot of this is not all that new. We've been using AI in our products for a very long time. Um, but Antoine and I were talking about there is a there is a moment now where people um, are discussing it in a way uh, that requires everyone coming together in the room, much like we're doing right now. So can I um, uh, a question to you and to the group? Um, I think what is new are the questions around fairness, transparency, accountability, bias in AI and machine learning tools. So from my perhaps limited vantage point, what I've seen over the past few years is the growth of a community of computer scientists and of social scientists who've been focusing on those issues. There's a, there's a community, an academic community called FATML, Fairness, Accountability, Transparency in Machine Learning, which has grown from a few dozen people to a few hundred and a few thousand people. Um, there's a huge AI conference in California every December, NIPS, Kate Crawford from the AI Now Institute. Institute did a keynote, which was 
sold out last December on topics around fairness and transparency. I feel that's not something that happened three or four years ago. Would you agree? Is that something that's new, do you feel? Or? No, I think those conversations have been happening around technology from the very beginning. I've been at Google for just about 11 years. Um, maybe the, the, the uh, sense of intensity or the sense of urgency around AI is different, but the conversations, the topics uh, are the same ones that I think we've been uh, asking questions about and, and trying to address for, the, for at least the 11 years that I've been at Google. Right. If I can just, oh, okay. please, Rashida. So I actually was going to say that I, what I think feels new is it's about the applications and that AI as a technology is not new. And even the companies that have been working on it have been working on it for years, but it's now being applied to a lot of sensitive social domains, which raise a lot of these fairness, bias, justice, the list goes on, um, issues. and. What, while I don't, I can't gauge whether or not the conversations have been happening forever. I do think there's an understanding that these have to be addressed with through a multidisciplinary lens because they're not simple issues. So if you're going to have a tool that's offering job postings that's now affecting a job market, which was plagued with gender and race issues already, so how do you navigate? problems that are systemic and structural that have lasted for a long time that now are being implicated by the technology. That's a great point. Commissioner Modas, you wanted to jump in? No, I, I just wanted to say that um, what I think is new is that suddenly we get to a point where you really need political choices and people somehow are afraid to see that there's different parts of the world in those parts of the world, I'm making different political choices. And so what do you want? And so the uh, feel that was just a, about technology, was about the AI and the 80s and the 90s, now you say, look, this is not about technology anymore. It's about making these choices for the future. And so there's where we get in. It's like, is it choices that we want to make as politicians? But then politicians are so far from AI. You know, most of the politicians were not trained in technology. They're not engineers. They have a very static way of looking at the world, a little bit like lawyers. So they look more into the snapshot than the flow. And that is just revolutionizing the way you do politics. And that's what you feel. And that's very new in the discussion. Uh, so it comes from like, like people that were nerds or a kind of nerds to a, a, a mass conversation. And uh, the point that I see today is that people are really afraid. And so people like you have also a responsibility to talk to the people and explain that, as I think Antoine just said and, and Ross, that this is just a tool. So it depends why you use the tool. So um, that's what I think is new in the, in the discussion so far. Could you just, thank you, could you give us a, a, an example of what one of those political choices is from the European mm -hmm. Union's perspective today? There's, there's several, but I think probably uh, the one that comes to my mind in terms of AI is that we have to make a choice at a European level what kind of AI do we want. Um, people are afraid that we want an AI that will replace us as human beings. And I think that people at Facebook, Google, and uh, Microsoft, and other companies agree that we have to make a choice. And I think that the European choice has been about uh, um, AI that one is human and it's based on our ethical I would say I'd call it like the ethical base of Europe has been always about humanism so it has to be about being a humanist and at the same time to be about being enhanced and being augmented and not being about replacing you and so that's not a technological choice you can have in different parts of the world a totally different vision just of having an AI that replaces you or AI that controls you, um, you know, and when I travel to other parts of the world, I feel that those different choices are being made. And so I think that we can lead as Europeans on that. Um, and of course, with allies around the world that think like us. Wonderful. Thank you. Minister Alama. So um, I might have a different perspective, but I agree with uh, the commissioner on this. Uh, the biggest challenges that we're seeing today with regards to isolationist policies, nationalism, and all of the, uh, let's say, negative trends, I think, do trace back to artificial intelligence and automation to a certain extent. 
because unfortunately today people don't understand the reason why they're losing their jobs they don't understand the reason why certain things are happening and they need to blame something or someone for it the first challenge that we have is unfortunately most science fiction um, let's say books most movies talk about artificial intelligence in a very negative spectrum so if you ask anyone the general public right now about artificial intelligence they'll talk about the robots that uh, have a doomsday scenario the terminator scenario uh, job losses not many people understand the positive applications of the technology. So I think the general consensus is quite negative, which is quite bad for the development of such a critical technology moving forward. The second issue is not enough people understand the technology per se. So Google and Facebook understand it, other maybe developed governments understand it. But generally across the planet, most um, decision makers, uh, most general public don't understand the applications of this technology so they can't be a part of the debate moving this technology forward what we're seeing today is twofold first it's the potential of this technology to do a lot of radically positive changes so we can see that in specific companies that started let's say 20 years ago and today became the most valuable companies on earth we can see that in governments that are using this technology to create really um, cutting edge, let's say, services that are being delivered to people. But at the same time, we're also seeing the, let's say, replacement of human intelligence to a certain extent in specific tasks that we use to create for ourselves. And this is a dilemma that we've always had. When the first industrial revolution came, it was the automation or the augmentation of, let's say, physical capability. And there was a lot of resistance towards that. You know, farmers felt like we, we need to have the right to you know, cultivate our uh, agriculture. We are the, the people that need to be protected. But automation came to that and progress came to that domain and things moved on. The same thing will happen to specific mental, uh, let's say, capabilities that will be automated because of AI. And that's a discussion that we need to have seriously globally with the private sector, with academia, with government and others. Thank you. On the please, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, something to go back to the new co new conferences you said, uh, um, and I think which is goes along the line is that I feel the the researcher, the the builder of the new AI technology, so the the scientists who've been there for a while, I mean since the fifties basically. Um, I think for for a while there was a bit of a disconnect between I'm trying to create new algorithm, I'm going to create new technology, but I'm not going to look too much into the applications of it and the implication, it was a bit separated. And there was, the, it's through the company pushing on how to apply it in the best way and also the scientists trying to how to develop the new algorithm, okay? Now what we're seeing as well because of all these reasons is that the, the two are connecting uh, very much. Is that the scientists, the, the mathematicians or the computer scientists are also trying to engage and to be part of this dialogue because they also want it to be perceived for what it is, right? Much more than try to la leave it to people who might not have all the c all the clues. Okay, so that's that's really a circle, uh, and I think that's why you have these new conferences that try to bring all the people in the same room. Hmm. Which goes to your point, Rashida, about the social applications of those of those technologies. Um, I want to come in a second to the public sector applications of, of AI. But before that, that, something that, uh, Minister, you were saying about educating governments and educating you know, other actors about AI. Tabitha, I mean, your, your company, that's partly what you do, right? Would you like, do you have, I'm sure you have views on how we can all get smarter about AI. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's not easy, and I think actually everybody who's here this morning should um, should be congratulating themselves that you made it here, that you wanted to at a at a uh, the Paris Peace Forum and come and talk about AI. So um, thanks for being here because it isn't easy and it's scary, and especially if you're not technical. Um, I myself am untechnical. Um, I threw myself into uh, understanding artificial intelligence because I genuinely believed that it was going to help my business. Um, and I struggled for over a year um, trying to deploy um, artificial intelligence and therefore created our business that we have today, Cognition X, to make it a little bit less lonely um, and hard to, to learn about the impacts of AI. So there are incredible courses um, if you want to become a data scientist, but there's very little information out there um, that uh, isn't, uh, as you described, sort of dystopian or utopian about actually what is the what is what is the truth and and what is out there and when it's moving at such a pace, it's really tough to keep up. So I commend you all for 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 being here and and trying to keep up. I think that governments struggle. We all in, struggle as individuals and. Um, 
your first point this morning um, about Facebook talking about who 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 is there and de developing this. I think we've got such a long way to go in making sure that the right people are in the room. Um, and and that I, that's where I really try and focus my energies is making sure that we have um, people from all walks of all walks of life um, actually there but not just in not just there but included so i think the big challenge we have is that we we put people in a room but we don't then empower them to put their hands up and go i think that's really creepy or i'm not happy with that or uh this isn't the way it should go because group think takes over however diverse uh a, a room a room is if we don't empower people. So that I think is our, probably our, our biggest challenge, next challenge to, to, to go on top of what we've discussed today. Brilliant. Thank you. On the, on the public sector applications of, of these technologies, my, my background has been much more working with governments and looking at transparency and accountability of different government processes. And I came to this issue earlier working on open data. And I felt that you know we'd done a huge amount of uh, of what well, we put a lot of effort and we'd had a lot of success in opening up government data for innovation. Antoine was talking about the importance of public data sets for the work that um, Facebook is doing, and it then dawned on me that this data was in part being used to distribute to allocate public services in different ways, and then I started to get curious about automated decision-making in public service delivery. So if you're running a healthcare ministry and you're responsible for the healthcare of tens of millions of citizens, there's the tens of millions who are directly receiving the healthcare, and then there might be the 5% or the 2%. The so-called, in computer science terms, is quite cold. They're the edge cases. But really what it is is that the people who stand to suffer the most if you get it wrong. And it, and it strikes me, again, being like Tabitha, an interested but non sort of technical sort of partner in the conversation, that how do we care? Because 2%, 5% of millions and tens of millions of people is a huge amount you know, of our citizens. And so, Rashida, I know that AI Now has spent a lot of time looking at different ways to do impact assessments to understand the social dimensions, which are very real. I mean, we're talking about, you know, as a mistake could mean that your cancer is not diagnosed. You will be turned away from a clinic because what looked like a cancer actually wasn't or was. What's your take? What do you? Um, so. First, I'll talk a little bit more about some what we're learning about the applications right. in the public sphere. Um, earlier this year, we held an event called Litigating Algorithms, where we brought in attorneys who had challenged different government use. And this was primarily in the United States, where there's been a lot more visibility about the problems around um, government use of automated decision systems. And there, we saw a myriad of issues. So one panel was on healthcare systems. So we saw governments that had limited budgets that had to figure out how to allocate resources, but they didn't seem to put, the, well, one, there wasn't a lot of transparency around the allocation of these systems, and there wasn't much accountability around the efficient use of them. So you ended up having these small percentages of people being harmed, but the harms were that people were getting their benefits cut off. And in a few cases, people died in the time of trying to get their benefits back or experienced other health consequences. We also saw examples of school teachers who had algorithms used to gauge their effectiveness as a teacher, but not using traditional methods that are used to see if it teacher is an effective teacher and there um, it ultimately resulted in some um, teachers being demoted and fired so that became an employment issue even though it started in education and what we found was that it seemed to be transparency and accountability were absent in all of these use cases and that there was not much information made um, known to the public before these systems were used and their problems were only, st or there were only an attempt to stop the problems after there had been some type of harm. So seeing how those problems evolved, we um, developed the algorithmic impact assessment framework, which tries to ch address some of those concerns. So one, it requires a government to give notice to its constituents about its intended use of a system and to do some type of impact analysis. So looking at whether it affects due process rights, 
what definitions of fairness are we actually even using to assess whether it's fair and a lot of other legal and social questions. Um, but it also opens it up to scrutiny by outside researchers and allows the public to have input because what I found with a lot of um, government use is sometimes it's asking the wrong question. So it may be there's a better way to build efficacy in how you administer healthcare, but if the question that you're asking around the implementation of an automated decision system is not actually the need that's needed for your constituents, then you're always going to have an imbalance. So it can also help, I think, in the long run, figuring out what are the right questions we're trying to solve with AI as a society. And do you find, so two quick rejoinder questions, I mean, to the, to the points that Tabitha and Minister Alulamam were making, do you find that government officials know enough about AI to be able to deploy those tools, and are the governments today that are deploying them? Because it strikes me in part, so, and that will come to governance in a second, our job at the Paris Peace Forum is to identify exciting projects, could be algorithmic impact assessments, that can then be replicated in different countries around the world, and we can learn from each other in different mm -hmm. ways. So. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, and this isn't to bash government because it's not simply that I think the government doesn't know enough about the AI, so it doesn't have enough technical understanding, but sometimes the government isn't best informed about the issues. So you also need people who are affected by the issues or at least getting the services that are administered to also give input on what is the ultimate question or problem we're trying to address, but then also is this the best technological solution or should we try to think about this differently? So I think there is a deficiency on both ends and that's why there's a need for different stakeholders. Wonderful. And, and, <laughs> so, so, and is it being deployed? Is a government right now deploying this tool? Or? Oh, the algorithmic yes, impact the, assessment? Yes. Um, can I pause? Now, now I paused it. Yes. Um, we're, <laughs> the, the Canadian government is looking to using this right now and is in the process um, of trying to do it through their budgetary process. And then there's a few local governments um, that have reached out to us about trying to implement. But I think it, dep it varies based on the level of government. So right now I'd say we're in a stage of a lot of governments assessing where and at right. what entry point, and, but there's definitely interest. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Modas, you wanted to no, I was just smiling because I, I spend a lot of my time in national government, <laughs> and um, I think that one of the really difficult things is that today governments don't have a lot of data, or if they have data, it's not curated, and so you take most of your uh, political decisions not based on data at all, right? And so we are so far from there in most of the European countries. I mean, I, I've been in a Portuguese government, and so... Uh, it's really, we are 10 steps behind. We have at least first to have people that can curate the data because the decisions, even with a little bit of data, would be better than the decisions that would we take today in most governments that are just based on the gut feeling or based on talking to people. And I've been always um, very assertive on saying that the European Union should be the place where a government in Europe can just say, look, I want to try this policy. What are the benchmarks? What are our people doing? What are the results? Very simple things. I mean, a lot of governments in innovation, they want to use tax credits. So I want to know what are the governments in Europe that use tax credits and what are the, the output and what are the results of that. And even that is difficult. So I think that uh, the first step is about how to curate the data in, uh, in the public area, which uh, we are not able to do uh, today. And then we can think about the algorithms and uh, the decisions. Um, but I was just uh, smiling because the reality, and of course, I mean, different parts of the world are in different uh, uh, shapes, but in Europe, we are still uh, really lagging behind on, on that, and that's a reality of national government. If I can just add to this point, I, I believe there's a lot of back and forth between me and the Commission in a good way. Um, I believe that this is the case for many countries, especially countries that have legacy platforms. So countries that already have had platforms that have existed for 200 years, it's very difficult to automate and to smartify uh, these systems. In a country like the UAE, for example, and I take no credit for this, I believe that, for example, that challenge is not there, but mm -hmm. it's important for us to ensure that other countries that we deal with also are able to leverage data and to take better decisions and that we can be more efficient. The biggest challenge we have with governments across the world today is around 80% of government spending is on operational expenses. So 
just day-to-day -day operations of the government, and less than 20% is being used for investment purposes. When you look at the private sector, the fact of the matter is most of, let's say, the profit, most of the income of the company is used to innovate and to accelerate because that's what the company needs to keep surviving in this day and age. Now, the biggest opportunity that governments have when it comes to data, for example, is the wealth of data that the government has is something that is going to be very valuable if you look at where you can use it, how you can you know, develop partnerships with the private sector and you know, um, deploy joint initiatives. Because let's, say, let's take a simple platform that I'm going to make up. So hypothetically, there's a company called Omar X. That's a private sector company. It's a competitor to Facebook. Uh, it's going to mine data to improve the services. Now, the data that it's going to have might be of a specific demographic or a specific age group or, or a specific group of people that it's going to try to diversify. When you look at a government, however, the amount of people that are in this government specifically might create data sets that are truly unique, that are truly global, that are worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that the government can use to improve its services and can use to deploy with the private sector to improve as well the services that are developed by the private sector. But unfortunately, not enough is being done on this uh, angle, I would say, globally. So not just Europe. I think globally there is a challenge. I can talk talk a little bit about what's happening in, in the UK. Um, it started with uh, Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State, when he was Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, created the data ethics framework. And to Rashida's point, the first the, the first recommendation there was, what question are you asking? And uh, the workbook that goes with this data ethics framework was all really uh, geared towards getting people within government to ask themselves why, how, uh, sorry, why and who is this for rather than just the how. Um, and that's now extended to the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation that's just been created um, uh, as, uh, as part of that same department, which will become an arm's length uh, body run by Roger Taylor. Um, and what I loved uh, about the name if nothing else, they've only just started, but data ethics and innovation in the same sentence has actually meant that um, the, the the spirit of the of the group is is all about trying to get academia together with industry in the room with government and regulators and sandbox stuff. And as as you're saying, like actually think a little bit freer than from the legacy that that is already there. Um, and so we're starting to see. Uh, pockets of, of innovation across whether it's uh, HMRC and, the, and our, the tax systems in the UK, but actually in the most recent budget, they've just um, allocated uh, budget specifically to look at the UK government's use of AI itself. And where I'm really excited about that is that if... Um, if we start to see the UK using, uh, the, the actual government using artificial intelligence, then we have to upskill the general public to be able to understand it, trust it, and use it. And so there's a really, um, there's a really interesting moment, I think, f that we have, and, and across Europe and across the world, now about making sure that we, we are trustworthy um, and we, we, we deserve that trust, uh, so that then we can start to, to think that these services are things that we want to use in our in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, at the moment, I think there's a lot of people who are saying, you know, we don't want anything automated, let alone any AI in it, um, and that's, that's going to be an issue. Can I, can I ask you a slightly provocative question, Tabitha, yeah. on that? So, you know, there's a lot of talk about AI nationalism and countries wanting to develop their own competitive advantage around AI, different industries, you know, sort of in some ways clo closing down um, around these issues. From your perspective as chair of the AI Council in, in the United Kingdom, what are the, how do you balance opening up and as Commissioner Moidas was saying, wanting and needing to learn lessons from other countries to understand both, you know, the point around surfacing existing new ideas by the private sector or civil society, sitting around a table with a multiple with multiple stakeholders to come up with these ideas. So how do you balance that opening mm. with, you know, AI nationalism and the fact that what may work in one country, some people have an incentive yeah. to not share it. Is, is that, am I just being sort of glass half empty? Am I wrong? <laughs> 
No, I think it's a really big. I think it's a really big challenge. I think um, what I'm seeing is everybody's trying to stop using the word race um, and take some heat out of um, there being sort of a race to the bottom. Demis Savas uh, talks a lot about how how do we see this as actually a set of sort of coordinated uh, agreements rather than a race and cutting corners and trying to finish things quicker than it, than other people. And I think that that message is flowing through. Um, we certainly think that all boats rise. Um, and the way that I, um, the way that I've personally been looking at this, so remember the AI Council is an independent from government, so I can't talk on behalf of the government. Um, but the way I, I see it, um, and I'm excited about is actually, where can we join forces, hold hands. The Paris Peace Forum is a really good example where there are big issues that aren't being solved any other way. So the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, around climate action, for example. Um, it's a really big issue that we haven't found a solution to, and yet something like artificial intelligence could support us. And I think that's the way we, uh, the only way we'll break down. Uh, so not only, I should never say only. That's one of the ways we could break down um, some of this nationalism drive and actually, how do we do this together? And how do we say, um, you know, it's like putting a man on the moon, but actually this is about saving our planet. That's maybe where we join forces and, uh, and can do, do some good. Antoine. Yeah, uh, I, w I wanted to add one point in, uh, on these joint forces. Uh, it's on the fact that actually uh, they can have a feedback loop in the sense that researcher can create new algorithm and it should be informed by basically what are the use cases. And uh, that's very important uh, and to, to have an ethical use, etc. But the other way around is that when you start to discuss with actually on specific issues or specific flows or algorithm, you mentioned about how can we actually uh, make it work for the 2%, for 2%, uh, et cetera. And actually, it's interesting because one of the major issue, like a fundamental issue of AI right now is learning for the, the edge cases. So AI is based on statistics, okay, most of it. And statistics is good for like the average, okay? The average, uh, we're good at that. But actually, the, the edge case is a fundamental different pro difficult problem. Mm -hmm. In the use case you mentioned, it's, ve it's, very, it's very crucial. But in many other places as well, if you talk about self-driving cars, or if you talk about uh, very different things, if you can go beyond and work on the edge cases, this is basically what the researcher think is basically where we can actually have a new leap forward in AI. Because this is where you try to go beyond the average and go into the specifics. And so, actually try to engage with actually the, the real applications. It might also, in the way back, help the researcher to go, to go beyond and maybe do it like this. And that's, that's, I think, something that we start to see that's very interesting. So forgive my ignorance, just a quick follow-up. And then, um, would it be fair to say that um, the, the private sector deployments of AI, you, you gave the autonomous cars example, but aside from that, would it be fair to say that the private sector deployment of AI, historically, we've heard from Ross and others, this has been going on for a while, were less focused on these edge cases. So again, the sort of smaller percentage of people who might be most affected negatively by, by these technologies, and that now that we're seeing sort of broader social deployments, we're seeing public sector deployments, there's more of a focus on the edge cases. Is that fair? Or is, am I misunderstanding? I mean, it's it's a complicated issue because, of course, it will depend on each application and what were the goals of each of the applications. But what I can say is that we didn't have the tools as well. Is that the, we are more and more like developing the tools to try to push the edge cases to the edge, if you want to know. So uh, for a while, it was basically we were this was only what we were able to do with the tools, and now we are trying to be better. Try to also develop application that can be tailored for some cases. Uh, and also with the fairness flow that Andrew said at the beginning. The fairness flow, if, if one thing is here to just to show us the edge cases, okay? We are basically, uh, when the people are working on the application, they will have a dashboard that will show the edge cases and where basically, in terms of demographics, uh, the, the, the performance is much, much worse uh, than some others. And so showing there. So then it's the choice of the people to try to say, are we going to focus on this one to solve it? Are we going to withdraw the application altogether, etc.? But I think that the, this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, because the, even if people didn't want to, to focus on the edge case or anything, we were not equipped to basically deal with them very well. So then it's a product discussion, it's an application discussion on how you do with it. Thank you. Commissioner Marez, you wanted to jump in? No, I just want to uh, be there on the AI nationalism and your point. And, and I think that when you talk about science, 
you can never talk about nationalism because science is not national. You know, and um, I um, uh, really could give you so many examples of that. When Einstein discovered uh, like the whole theory of general relativity, he was a man alone in 1915. Last year, we got the first paper on the gravitational waves, right? That proves that Einstein was right. That paper was written by more than 1,000 scientists all over the world. So there's very little things today that you can do alone, or even in your own discipline. With Rashida, we just uh, mentioned that interdisciplinarity is essential. So um, having some kind of like AI nationalism uh, program or strategy, I'm sorry, I mean, it doesn't work. Science doesn't work like that. So I, I would say yes, countries. I mean, I, for instance, France, I think that's very good. I've been like looking at AI for humanities, a very good strategy. But it has to be together. It has to be in a multi-stakeholder approach of the world, not even the European Union. I, I don't know if you... Yeah, I agree. There's something um, uh, that I heard actually this morning. Putin's um, speech where he said, um, or was claimed to have said, oh, uh, that the person who, the, the country that rules AI will rule the world. I found out that this was said after school children had displayed um, some school projects. And this was him just congratulating the people in the school that had done AI projects. But the press had gone and taken just that one sentence, and then that had, had become the story. But this was just, this was just a conversation at, at a school. And I think this is a real issue that we have, is um, it's far sexier for the press to talk about there being uh, a race and a battle and a fight, and a, it, because it makes a good story. Um, and so it's, it's things like this, which I, which I really like, because hopefully we then are showing that actually this is much more about collaboration than it is about um, than it is about a fight, a race. So uh, I believe that there is a race. Um, I, I, it might be controversial, but not a race in the matter of controlling AI. Um, I think there was a race for development in the past where countries wanted to develop the fastest, they wanted to put the infrastructure, they wanted to build the buildings. And the race was to have the most, I would say, beautiful architecture, the most beautiful country, and the, most, the biggest industry to lead the economic narrative. What that gave us was climate change to an extent. Um, you know, irresponsible development of, let's say, the urban, the urban side of things or the industrial side of things. The same thing is happening with artificial intelligence today. So uh, the race is happening whether we, we acknowledge it or not. There are, I would say, three approaches to this. There are, so let's, let's say that artificial intelligence is a black box. There are countries that are saying, we don't care what happens in the black box as long as the answer that comes out is right. There are other countries like Europe that say, we don't care if the answer is right. We want to understand what goes inside the black box to ensure that it includes everyone. And there are other countries that are saying, we don't care what goes in or what goes out as long as we have the biggest black box. <laughs> so in this narrative or in this way that things are moving forward, there is a race, which I think is unfortunate because uh, AI is going to cut across borders. That's the first thing, and we know this for a fact. The second is the applications of it, the, the positive are very big, and the negative as well can have very drastic negative applications. And this we see today. So we talk a lot in this panel about the uh, edge, let's say demographics, the one or two percent. But I can argue that maybe 50 percent of people are being affected by negative use cases of AI, specifically in addiction, for example, to specific platforms. So, you know, in this specific case, this will have many negative applications on every person on Earth moving forward if we don't go and fix this issue. So I believe that we need to have a more open narrative when it comes to artificial intelligence. We need to have a more global narrative. Uh, it's important for us to talk about this openly and to have all stakeholders be a part of this discussion and to show why this is not, and, and I think this is the most important thing, to show why this is not a race or why it shouldn't be a race. It should be a collective action that's taken by everyone. So how do we do this? So, so, so to you, Minister, to, to other panelists, like I think that from an audience perspective, so we've heard about challenges, we've heard about some sort of specific solutions from Facebook, the algorithmic impact assessments, and we've heard a lot about 
bringing people together, having multiple stakeholders at the table. In concrete terms, from a governance perspective, how do we do that? So Tabitha was talking about initiatives in the UK, which are opened up to other countries. Um, there's, a, there's a private sector civil society initiative called the Partnership on AI, which has its annual meeting starting tomorrow, um, which brings civil society major private sector companies, including Google, Alphabet, and Facebook, um, around the table to try and develop best practices. Governments at this point are not at the table. How, how do we do this? You know, is it... It, it's, I worry a little bit for sometimes that we are trying to boil the ocean, right? Should we pick a theme? Should we say, back to my sort of opening points around AI touching on all sorts of different services and political points, should we pick a theme and say, right, we are looking at healthcare. We're looking at education for children between zero and 10. And we're looking for countries that are interested to look at AI applications in those settings and work with private sector and work with civil society. Is that a way around it? How should we think about it, Rashida? So I feel strongly that no, <laughs> only because I think all, all of those issues are important. So to say that one is more of a priority than another, I don't know how you make that calculation, especially on a global scale where there's different implications in different countries. But I do think data governor, gov, governance and um, creation is a place to start because there is a lack of standards there and a lot of these problems derive from problems with the data um, in that you, if you have a flawed data set that is going to reproduce problems, then there may not, like you may have one use case that's problematic, but then that same data set's going to be used in other problematic ways. So I think that's one concern is that our data doesn't also have boundaries. And we've talked a lot about how more data is good, but I don't necessarily agree with that because most of our countries also protect privacy. So I think it's one, finding out the right standards around how are we collecting data that also abides by our existing legal frameworks and values, but then to once we do have that data, whether it's public data or private data, what standards can we employ to make sure that people have access to information to figure out the best ways to use it. And I know one um, thing that's come up is a Microsoft paper on data sheets for data sets, which is just a set series of questions that someone needs to answer when creating a data set. So there is a way to kind of gauge, oh, there may be bias problems, there may be fairness problems, no matter how that data set is used. Are you advocating in this that we should have, as in the open data community, that we should have an open by default approach to data? How do we, a lot of this data is commercially confidential, a lot of this data is hard to get. If we were to do a more sort of multilateral approach to data governance, how would it work from a privacy, national security, confidentiality perspective? How are you thinking about so this? So I wasn't necessarily advocating for it to be open because I think that's I think that is the best way to go but there are a lot of there's a lot of data that even if it is de-identified can become identified after a while and a lot of sensitive data I think it's more standards around how that data is organized and implemented so if you are going I think it's just being clear about what you're doing with the data can help with mitigating some of the problems that we're discussing and it is a way of creating standards beyond boundaries. Wonderful. Thank you, Ross. You wanted to Thanks, Mark. I just I want to point out that a lot of the conversations that we need to be having, we actually are having. When I look back at the again, you know, the the years that I've been involved in technology policy, I don't think we've I've seen a period where we've all been as engaged in these conversations and representatives of those conversations are sitting with you right now. Governments are engaged, civil society is engaged, academics and industry. Uh, I'm actually very optimistic that we are having the conversations we need to have. Certainly there are edge cases that need to be addressed, real problems that need to be addressed, but we are having those conversations in a way that um, I feel like I wish we, were have, we had had many, many years ago uh, you know, when the conversations were uh, taking place in much smaller groups of, of folks at IGF or in other places. So I'm very optimistic. I, I think the role for governments right now is still very much one of encouraging the adoption of AI, of providing models for usage of AI in a 
responsible way and helping educate the public about the issues and what we all need to know about. And Google, you know, just a couple months ago, we published our seven principles on AI, and we included some bright lines. And those were meant to be um, uh, guidelines for our own use of AI in our products, but also to contribute to the debate that we were just talking about. This is, these are the things we think make sense, and these are the areas that we need to be paying attention to. Facebook has done the same, Microsoft and others have, governments have. So again, I, I, I don't want us to let the edge cases or the very real concerns overshadow something which is, I believe, ultimately an incredibly positive force in the world. Antoine, and then yeah. I'll pass to you. Yeah, just to add to that, I think there is uh, an open source culture in the AI community that that's very good uh, in the sense uh, the big actors living the platform on which we are doing AI at Facebook or Google are open source. Uh, there are even like a whole sorts of program to actually empower academics or startups to, to use them and to develop them. And in general, um, it makes that access to actually the AI code is very easy. So we have to make sure that it's uh, it's also responsible in the way that's also in terms of the application, maybe the role of the government or education or academia, etc. But uh, it means also that I mean that's that's the will is that the diversity of the people who could be able to have their hand of the code and try it out and create new application and find the edge cases and work on them is uh, is is pretty small. I mean it's uh, it's pretty easy to do, and uh, and so that's something that makes me optimistic as well in the sense that this is not like some code that can be developed only by a few actors and that nobody else can touch other, except if you're actually joining them. You could actually develop a lot of things. And we see a lot of um, new parts of the world that are developing a new tech scene based on AI code and develop, uh, based on maybe some of the applications they care about, but using the code that we use for something else and applying them and creating actually new community there. That, that's, that's really nice to see. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. I mean, coming from the open community, that legacy and continuing legacy of open source and open data is a very positive force in AI. Commissioner Modas, I'm going to turn to you in a second. I just want to, um, to the audience, in about five minutes, we'll turn to questions. So you can ask questions via the app or directly. So please start thinking about your questions. Um, Commissioner, I had a, a, a question, which is, so we were talking about data, talking about data governance. Um, I hear a lot of people come to me and, and we're a funder as well as an investor and a, and, a, and a policy shop. People come to me and say, oh, you know, Martin, all of your questions around data and data rights, it's, it's all taken care of, right? We have the GDPR, we have the General Data Protection Regulation, it's all fine. So my question to you is, what, what's to come, what's needed from a regulation perspective around data that isn't at this point in GDPR? There are questions around group privacy, and I think that one of the big learnings I and others have had over the past year is that our data and data about others and data about us can have impacts on our societies as a whole, in addition to impacts on us. And that, for me, was a watershed moment. The entire privacy community for the past 20, 30 years was based around making the case that you know, something bad was going to happen to you and your life if you didn't have these privacy standards. And now what we're saying is that that's true. And it's also true that it has these societal implications. And there was this recent paper, I appreciate it wasn't an EU official paper, by.
say, look, part of what we've done was wrong, but at least we did it. Uh, but I'm a defender of like having the data as someone that is part of my dignity, is part of myself. And so I want to be educated about it, and I, then I take my own decisions. But never decisions about science. I think those are not part, I cannot sell. But if I sell my data to Google or Facebook, I want to get that paid by the data that I actually, if they're using it, I would love to be paid for it. So, you know, it's my right. Uh, so there's a huge, there's, I need to move to questions from the audience. There's a huge discussion there that we have just unearthed as we're getting warmed up yeah. on data ownerships and data rights. I actually seriously think that um, we'll probably come back to it, but to have a side meetup around those topics with interested members of the audience or the panel would be fabulous. And this is an area that we um, have done a lot of work on and very interested in. I'd like to open up to questions from the audience. I have a few on the app, which I'll come to if there are no questions yet in the audience. So I have, yes, a question just about zone two. Gentleman in the back, yep. Thank you. Um, my name is Georgios Kostakos from the Foundation for Global Governance Sustainability. I wanted to know, uh, we have this discussion, it's very exciting what can happen in terms of data processing and uh, robots, etc. The thing is the frame of mind and the end goal for why this is happening. And I think that people are less and less convinced that it is working in their favor because they see that they are losing ground in terms of employment, in terms of the increase in inequality, etc. So when you want uh, artificial intelligence and you introduce it, uh, can you claim and explain how this is helping uh, get to the better world that we think robots working for us all, having less, uh, let's say, manu manual labor and things like that. It, f it feels like the companies are want, want to increase their, uh, uh, their money, their, their, their share value, and not to serve the majority of people as humanity. So can that, is that the case? If it's not, can you explain? And I hope it changes if it is not. Thank you. Thank if it you. is. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm keen to get a second question. And I want to. So I'm looking at, uh, yes. So if I could have, yeah, number seven and then the lady with the yellow scarf. Thank you. Hello, Karina Knight. I'm a representative of Church and Peace. Um, defense is a special case, it is given that status very frequently in the EU and um, in particularly in France. Um, I want to know what the panel thinks with, for example, the um, European Defence Fund, which hasn't had civil society input, um, has been swept through with um, over a third of the members of industry on the board, not um, civil society, where they feel that AI with regards to defence should be controlled because it's always considered a special case. Um, we don't discuss it, it happens in the arms industry and then it's on the street. And this is one of the AI um, situations that people are scared of and um, is a very moral and eth ethical question. And I would like to know where the panel stands. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Um, I'll come back to the panel now. So we have two Two quite different questions. I'm going to add to the first question a question from the app. So the first question was, um, you know, how can we work with people who are not convinced that AI will work in their favor? And I'm just going to link that to the notion of trust. So what I've noticed, especially in the UK over the past few months, is a lot of AI companies doing deliberative um, participatory work, citizen juries, trying to get a sense of people's confidence in AI tools. Where does that confidence stop or not? We have a question on the app saying, in concrete terms, how will governments gain citizens' trust in AI after scandals such as Cambridge Analytica? So trust by the public, by our citizens in these technologies. Let's spend sort of five minutes on that with the group and then come to the question on defense, which strikes me as related but also think that's part of the question. So the question of trust, please, yeah. Ross. The, the, question of, the question of trust is, is, a, is a great one. And I think one of the things that certainly companies are, like, like ours is, is trying to do, and governments as well, is better explain how AI is already being used. I think there is this problem with seeing AI as almost a separate silo this new form of technology, when the reality is that Google has been using, for example, AI for many, many years. Uh, we use AI to block spam messages. We block 8 billion spam messages a day. 
that's only possible using something like AI. We use AI to ensure that YouTube doesn't become flooded with violent extremist videos. Uh, we took down 8 million, I think, videos the last quarter, and 6.5 million of those 8 million were reviewed by AI and not by a person um, because of the, the volume of it. So I do think that part of the problem is this view that AI as a technology is something different, is siloed off. What I do believe, as Rashida said earlier, why AI is gathering uh, so much interest on the public's part is, is, the, is the use cases and the applications. And there is a lot of work to be done to, to allay people's concerns and fears on that front. You know, work, the future of work, of, of course, is certainly one of those issues. Uh, again, we, we're optimists in that regard, and we believe that there are more jobs that will be created by this technology than are going to be lost, which is not in any way to say that it's not going to be painful and that governments and companies have a role to play in training the, the workforce of the future, um, which I think we've been a little late to the game in, in doing. But I, again, I don't want to lose the sense of optimism. And part of what we uh, need to do a better job of doing is really explaining what AI is and what it is not, which is the separate silo. So there's one part which is explaining to people what AI is, what it's not, what some of the successes are. There's another part which is understanding what people's fears are. How, how do people think about this? Is this work that... Um, so again, this is why we have the algorithmic impact assessment framework, because it tries to address this issue, and it, I think it's a mechanism for building greater community trust in that one. I think it's on the government to share information about what is being used, and even if it you can't say what its outcomes are, what is it being optimized for, and then engaging the public. So I think Tabitha made this point earlier that I really loved and is important, that I think there's a difference from just giving notice and telling the public what's happening and actually engaging them in discourse to understand what the problem is. And I think if you ask people, like, what, how are you feeling about the fact that we may use an automated decision system to decide whether or not you receive health care and they feel like they're being heard or at least their responses are being used to mitigate some of the problems, then that's how you can engender greater trust in the public and you can have a more productive process of using these technologies for good. Do you feel, just a question from to do the app justice and the people who put great questions in the app, do you feel, Rashida, and there's a question here, are there different expectations or tolerance around decisions made by human beings versus AI systems? Is there a difference, a sort of a normative difference that people apply, do you think? Ooh, yeah, tough question. Um, yes, in part that I think, I think a lot of this, speaking of trust, goes back to community trust and government and that if you've experienced some type of harm, not from a technical system, but from administration of government decisions, then you're less likely to have faith in a more uh, like an, an automated form of it. So I think it depends on the group or individual experience and whether or not they land on being less or more trusted. It, it, it's a tough one at a time when people tend not to trust their governments very much. But Antoine, you wanted to jump yeah, in? Uh, I think to between trust in humans or, or AI, I think there is a matter of transparency, explainability. Uh, so. There is an expectation that even if you disagree, or if a human makes a mistake, actually you could explain they could explain why, and give you the reason why. So you might actually disagree, but you you can follow the process and maybe relate to it as well, or at least try to understand. Whereas uh, to go back to the black box uh, image, if there's a black box taking the decision, there is a sense of arbitrary. There is a sense of a lot of a lot of uh, fantasy can be put in the black box as well uh, in terms of people making it for for some reason or not. So I think the, here, the, I think our, our job as, uh, as scientists, as makers, as, uh, as people using AI or employing it is to try to make a better job at explaining why these decisions are made. So yes, saying this decision has been made by an automatic system is the first point. And this is why it's been made, because you're part of these demographics, because you, 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 are, you did this, this, uh, this stuff, this stuff, because you input these choices. I mean, there's a lot of things. Because the machine believes that, I mean, there is also a lot of probabilities there. So maybe we should be a better job also trying to maybe 
explain more uh, in layman term what probability means and basically what are the, um, the rationale behind that. Thank you. If I can have a last question on yeah. this one and then I'll move us to defense. No, I just wanted, I mean, we live in a time of distrust. People uh, distrust science um, today. And I think that one of the things is just what Antoine was saying, you don't explain the process. And scientists don't tell people that uh, there are things they know and there are things that they don't know. Uh, and second, I think that people are much, I mean, prone to forgive another human being than a machine. I mean, when the, uh, this last case of the accident in California where the um, uh, car, um, the self-driving car just killed that person, unfortunately, um, I think that at first people thought, okay, the, it was just a mistake. But then when people discover that the car made the decision not to stop, and that was, told, that was told to me by one of the guys involved. Then you say, so it was the decision to kill the person because uh, the other people that were in the car would be in more danger if, he, if the car would not kill that person. Then it's really scary. And I understand that people get scared. So you have to understand better the systems and you have to explain what are the things that the algorithms are doing, especially when there is the life of people that are in danger. Thank you. I, I'm not going to stop it then. We'll, we'll come to defense in a second. I don't want to stop a lively conversation. Minister, and then Tabitha, please. So, so just to, to add to that point, I think artificial intelligence is not new, as uh, some of the panelists said today, but I think the applications right now are new. So if we are going to look at it as scientists, scientists experiment, they see the impact, and then they generate some sort of thesis or they are able to put a theory together that moves forward. Um, sometimes we look at things purely from an economic sense. So if we deploy AI in agriculture, we're going to save 10 billion. But if you look at the social uh, impact, if you look at other impacts, the security, so on and so forth, you will figure out that you're going to end up spending much more because people will be left without a job, there's going to be unrest, there's going to be uh, different things happening that will cost the government more than just economic impact. It's important for us to look at this holistically. So even robots that take your jobs or robots that, that replace people, if we understand the true impact, we will be able to then plan better forward to actually create a, a plan for this. I also think that um, since this is just starting, every single individual can be a part of it. That's the beauty of it. So, you know, whether it's, you're a person that's an engineer, whether you're a person who knows nothing about artificial intelligence, if you are trying to understand it, if you're trying to be a part of this future, you will have a place. The challenge now is getting people to rally behind that notion of, yes, we want to be a part of this. Yes, we want to understand it. And we want to be, you know, AI literate to an extent. Thank you. Tabitha. I just wanted to pick up on um, the part of George's question that I really thought we, we may have missed, which was... Um, Right now, the end goal is not in the favor of the people. And that, that I thought was a really interesting uh, point because I think that if we can solve that, we can solve a lot of the problems we just said now around trust. And actually, we have to make sure that, um, that governments are thinking what the, what the end goal, goal is for the greatest good of society. Um, and uh, the reason I raise it again is because it's good for this forum <laughs> specifically, and we should be uh, talking to our governments about where should we be applying this that is good for, for the greater good. Um, a, a small case study of, of how the UK is looking at this, um, the industrial strategy is um, specifically aligned to four grand challenges, and those are in uh, clean growth, future mobility, um, aging society, and then, uh, and then there is one on AI and data. But What's so important is that they have chosen grand challenges that are good for society and then in the hope that industry and academia rallies to solve some of the biggest world problems um, rather than looking at this the other way around. And I think Mustafa Siliam from, again, quoting DeepMind, uh, said we've got too many uh, scientists and, and, and AI experts who are looking at how do you get the right drink to the right person rather than how do we get clean water. Mm. Um, and so my kind of call to arms, uh, not arms, call to action for everybody <laughs> here um, is, is looking at the UN Sustainable Development Goals or whatever in your country is the most important things and applying AI there because then we are applying it for uh, the right end goal um, rather than the wrong end goal. Wonderful, thank you. And then um, I want to come to the question around defense. So defense, whether it's the European Defense Fund or, or others, um, is it different? How should AI 
in military defense settings be controlled? Can we have the same degree of engagement by external stakeholders as we've been talking about? What are people's thoughts on that? So uh, I'm not the expert on uh, the European, uh, let's say, scene on this, but I think it's important for us to um, look at how this technology is going to be used from a defense perspective. So, for example, I think cybersecurity is very important, and we need to ensure that the cybersecurity systems are you know, invested in and AI algorithms are being used to protect our countries and to protect different citizens across the world. I think if it's a purely defense mechanism to ensure that livelihoods of people are not affected, then there's not much, I would say, negative uh, angles there. The, the biggest challenge is the offensive side of things, so autonomous weapons and how that would affect the lives of individuals. And in my perspective, and I'm not, not representing my government on this, I'd say it's very important for us to look at autonomous uh, weapons very seriously and to try to avoid them as much as possible just because you know, the applications of them are going to be endless and they might have some very negative impacts. But um, I would definitely say if it's purely defense-oriented and in a way that does not affect, let's say, people's privacy, if it's in a way that does not affect other countries, it isn't as bad as you know, it's, it's made to seem in the media. Thank you. Commissioner. No, just a comment on the fact that, um, as you know, Europe um, in the last five years has decided to come together to have a European Defence Fund. That European Defence Fund uh, is a part about research, a smaller part, and then is more about procurement, is more about how we work together. And so there's a structure of 23, 24 countries that came together. And so uh, in terms of defence, I think we're talking about something that is totally different. And as everything that we do, I mean, when you talk about research, in defense, when you talk about other matters in defense, they are different and they have to be about protecting uh, people. But I agree with the minister uh, that in terms of weapons, uh, we should have a totally different, strict way of looking at it. What I'm worried about the question, and I'd like on a bilateral way to talk with uh, the person that asked the question, is that being myself in national government and then at the supranational level, um, we are very good at the European Union to consult with people, uh, to get people involved in every decision so I was a little bit astonished about the point that you didn't feel involved in this decision because I know that there was so much of the public consultation about it we had to hear all the countries and everybody um, and so I would be interested probably outside of uh, the stage to talk to you about it because that I think it's quite rare in European politics not to involve uh, people in the different countries and different organizations. Thank you. Did you want to jump in, Rashida? Yeah, I actually wanted to share um, a little bit of what we've learned in the United States and that there's a similar issue, I guess, in that defense and public safety, um, so local law enforcement are often excluded from a lot of transparency, accountability, or other oversight mechanisms. And at least in New York City, what we found is that the, those problems eventually came to a head to create greater scrutiny about government use generally. So there was a task force that was created to look into government use of aut automated decision systems in one of the things that led to the passing of this legislation was the fact that there were a number of surveillance technologies that were acquired by the local law enforcement department where no one knew how they were acquired, how they were being used until there were problems raised. So I think, I don't think those areas should be carved out completely and there's definitely issues of concern that require certain scrutiny, but in a way the lack of scrutiny in those areas have opened up the conversation more. Thank you. So. With the time we have, I'm afraid we don't have time to go back to the, to the audience. I have time to take a question from the app. Um, and if we have some quick answers on that, it, it'll be a hard question. So there won't be quick answers, but we'll try. And then I'll try and do a wrap up um, at the end. So this is a question which is really about bias. So governments haven't managed to take care of biases and other social issues or struggled to take care of them over the past 50 years. Gender equality is mentioned. So what can we do to make sure that AI as a field represents our pluralist communities? And the person says what's alarming is that AI is mainly created by white men in Silicon Valley. So how do we, how do we ensure that AI is representative of pluralist communities, gender, ethnicity, that it's, that it's representative? What are people's thoughts on this? Yeah, um, so uh, as a white man doing AI, um, in France, in Europe, <laughs> uh, 
No, I completely acknowledge this point, and uh, and we, I think we try to be more. We must be more deliberate in trying to bring more diverse profile uh, in the builders, so the researcher, but also in the people applying it. Uh, so there is a, a a lot of initiatives now to try to be more proactive and try to get more diverse profile into the AI community, uh, as uh, with scholarships, uh, with uh, summer school, with online education tools, a lot of things. I just want to mention one, which is the, the new master for uh, AI um, that has been created in Africa. Uh, right now, it's uh, it's in Kigali. Uh, it's a master for like uh, 30 students this year. Uh, and the idea is uh, to start uh, this new initiative, I try to build the best master in the world and to put it there. And everything is funded for the students, uh, and the students are actually very good. And, um, and so uh, there, the, the curriculum and the program is going to be taught by the best uh, professor in the world. I mean, Yann Lequin, Yoshua Benjo, people from DeepMind, Jeff Dean, I think is going, etc. So it's like, if you look at the, this is a new master going in a place where uh, the, the, the tech scene is starting, but maybe you are, don't have the leaders and scientific leaders yet. And so you go there and you try to build the best master ever there. And people actually from the AI community have really deliberately tried to help. So I think the lineup of professors is really insane. And the number of applications they get for the master is completely crazy. And so with this kind of initiative, the idea is that it can blossom and basically create there some new professor that will create new new masters, etc., and that will drive the education. So this is just one example, uh, but I think I agree with the point that we should do more. So it's a good example. What are others? Minister and then maybe Rashid others? So I think the biggest challenge that we have is with the data that we have, the history that we feed into this artificial intelligence really uh, enforces the bias angle because certain countries have a lot more data than others. Um, certain platforms create a lot more data than others. Historically, certain data sets are biased towards the winner, I would say, rather than the loser. And um, in a sense, there are a lot of uh, inclusion issues there. So I completely agree with, with the norm. To develop these systems, to push them forward, if we want to develop it in a way that is good for all humanity everywhere on Earth, we need to specifically try to choose the data set that we use to train this algorithm. We, we want to ensure, and I know that this is not realistic at this point because certain countries have moved forward, uh, certain companies have moved forward as well, but it's important for us to curate the data that goes into these systems to ensure that it's not, for example, biased towards white men or it's, it does not exclude, let's say, women or you know, Africans um, uh, or people of, with dark skin. It's important to do that. And I think we don't do enough of that. With regards to having a discussion, um, I know that many of the panelists mentioned that we have a lot of forums right now on artificial intelligence, and that's a good thing. It, I would agree. And I think it's about time we move from quantity to quality. We need to come out with specific outcomes that really can have tangible outputs for people to see. And we, for example, in the UAE, host something called the World Government Summit that hosts a platform on artificial intelligence or the governance of AI that looks at specific uh, issues such as data bias, such as how do we actually create an experimental governance policy that ensures that all countries can be included in this, so on and so forth. Thank you. Tabitha, Rashida, last word on this question for the morning. Um, so I think on, as far as inclusion, I think there are there is a lot of work happening around pipelines, but I also think you need to create a culture because th where people want to stay because retention is also a problem in that mm. there are a lot of experts in certain areas, but they don't want to stay. Um, but then also I think ongoing work that Google, Facebook, IBM, and Microsoft, all of the companies are doing with helping those who are already doing this work to doing this work to understand the questions that they're grappling with. So really getting someone to understand that there's 19 different definitions of fairness and what does it mean when you choose one and fairness could be um, not aligned with justice. So just understanding the gravity of some of the implementations and work that people are doing, I think can also help address some of the bias issues. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with um, what everyone said. I think there's one, um, there's one quick win that we have, which is empowering, uh, specifically uh, around women, but empowering women to believe that they uh, are uniquely going to be very helpful when it comes to artificial intelligence. So I think a lot of the traditional skills that women have been uh, told to foster uh, are actually things like 
understanding the question, cognitive thinking, creative thinking, caring, nurturing, and actually we just need to talk a lot more about the fact that we need the women who are already at these companies to get involved, move department, walk across the, the across the uh, corridor, like find uh, find these people uh, and uh, and join in um, uh, and be encouraged and welcomed and invited because. The pipeline issue is 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 a real issue, and it's going to take a lot longer to fix than just welcoming uh, more people into the process. Thank you. So we're at the end of time. I'm going to try my hand at a quick wrap up. Um, so we spoke about impact. We spoke about the impact of AI. We said that the applications, the social impact, the applications of AI are new, and seeking to understand those and to really get stuck in is key. That's one. Secondly. Um, I think that the thread around the importance of open, whether it's open source or open data, is an important one, and I think is is not actually spoken enough about uh, enough about in these settings. Um, but the third point I'd highlight is this one around that what we focus on. You know, like are we spending too much of our energy focusing on getting the person, as you said, quoting Mustafa, you know, the right drink at the right time, rather than working on the SDGs, rather than working on how we can use AI to unite our communities, which are fractured at this point in time. Um, the fourth point I'd highlight is that let's try and get away from this notion of race. Let's find ways to work together, and that one of the areas we can work together is on this issue of data governance and how we can collect data, how we can develop standards for how data is collected. There have been other efforts around data, global multi-stakeholder initiatives. I was involved in the setup of the International Aid Transparency Initiative, which developed a data standard in foreign aid, very successful. I think this type of work around technical standards, which can be sort of like more, you know, less sexy, more on the sidelines, is very impactful for the, for the pipes, for the infrastructure of this work. And then lastly, we started touching on this question around data ownerships and data rights and how people are engaged. And I think that's, I actually mean it seriously, I think having a side question on that, having a meeting up would be extremely exciting. So I'd like to thank my panel this morning for a fantastic, lively conversation, the audience in the room and on the app. Thank you very much.